Before I start, I want to thank the people, not only who invited me here, but for all of the extended family that were descended from Jim Ronk, who provided, as, as John O'Keefe said, this incredibly encouraging, generous, and intellectually open atmosphere. And, and, and the reason I'm here, I'll tell you in a second, um, it absolutely changed the way science could be done. And, af and seeing, for example, Hopkins Medical School, and then seeing here, you could see the incredible difference in what, in, in, in what open-minded acceptance can do for people's creativity. So thank you so much. Now, um, I, uh, I'm here, I think. It's a good reason to ask why. Uh, because when I started graduate school, I was a student in David Alton's lab, where a postdoc named Susan Mitchell was working, who had worked with Jim. They published this paper. She gave me a whole stack of papers, including uh, yours. And, uh, and David Alton said, well, listen, Susan is doing this recording single units, and I want you to learn that from her. She's leaving in two weeks. <laughs> and uh, so what did I know? I said, OK, I got, you know, that was standard, and I tried to learn it. But you know, I only learned a little bit. And uh, so then I decided uh, when I oh, and these were electrodes that were fixed in place. They weren't drivable. And so I heard that John Kuby had invented this new electrode. So I came up to Downstate for the first time and learned how to build these Kuby drives, which was great. And it was on that visit I first met Jim Ronk. And I learned he was an MD. I said, Jim. I mean, I didn't say John. I said Dr. Ronk. Um, <laughs> I was, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I, how come you're doing science instead of instead of uh, medicine? And you said, well, I like science, <laughs> and uh, and that was terrific. Now, um, history goes on, and the lab continued to be helpful. And this is the first email, according to this, that John Kuby sent. He said it was probably from Bob Mueller. I can't tell you, uh, Matt. This is really from John Kuby. This is my first experience with email. We'll see how it goes. He was sending me a clock sequence for doing reporting with stereotrodes. What an advance! It was amazing. Could record and actually discriminate hippocampal neurons. And the lab continued to help me out, and I didn't deserve it. Um, Bob Mueller and, and Cliff Kentros is here. He knows this story. Um, Cliff Contros and Bob Mueller were doing an experiment to see whether or not NMDA receptor antagonists could impair the um, learning and persistence of place fields. And Bob looked back at an, at an abstract. He looked back at an abstract, and there he found our report that, that, had, that, that, that we saw that. And he found exactly the same results, and he said, well, you have to be part of this. I mean, what a generous guy. He was a, he was a saint. He was a grumpy saint, but he was a saint. And, and, I, and I, wish, I wish he were here so I could... Uh, Tell him that, um, not the grumpy part. OK. So now to, to the heart of it. Now, uh, the reason I'm interested in the hippocampus is because I'm interested in memory. And when I heard that there was something called place cells, place fields, I thought, nah, that can't, that can't be right. And then I saw them, and they were right. And uh, you know, there they were. I couldn't really deny it. And, um, but to try and understand them, I came at the, from this perspective, guided by the fact of uh, Taking out the hippocampus in a person causes terrible amnesia. So this is a picture of HM's brain and drawing, and a picture of the MRI done later. And in, in fact, it's it, the, the amnesia that is caused by hippocampal damage goes much more subtly and much deeper. So that only losing CA1, if you believe these reports, it, after a stroke, can cause an amnesia so severe that a person who copies this drawing called the Ray Ostrich drawing um, forgets it within 15 minutes and can only show what's at the bottom. What's, what's really great is the, the same, same neuron that responds selectively to a particular movie clip fires again in advance of the person telling the experimenters what movie he just saw. And, it's, and this neuron that fired after the stimulus was first presented fires before the person says, oh yeah, I think it was Tom Cruise on Oprah. And, and, and so you can see uh, what I think is a really key problem in, in memory that I'm quite interested in. And that is how this cognitive map that we have is actually used, um, firing of hippocamp single hippocampal neuron, to, uh, to retrieve information. Now, this is actually, there have been some inklings of how this works from a long time ago. This is a slide from John O'Keefe's uh, paper with um, Speakman, one of my favorites, where, where John showed that when a, a, a place field fired in a particular location during a spatial memory task, tied to stimuli that you could control, when the animal was returned to that task and after given the sample of information that he needed, the cues that defined where he was were removed, the cell fired just as though the cues were there. And, and so what I'm really interested in is the mechanism by which this memory retrieval occurs. And I have the same quote that Howard put up, so I'll be quick. Jim Ronk was talking about the, the, the problems that you might have if the hippocampus or these cells were responding to things that were not simple sensory 
motor behavioral correlates. And what he suggested were that drive states, ideas, time, and memory retrieval may be things that you can't see. And I think what we've done since, I mean all of us, is we've not just looked at behavior but compared identical behaviors with different cognitive demands. And so the rest of the talk I'm going to tell you about um, this uh, notion. So as I said, I'm interested in memory. The fascinating thing is you have a momentary experience that's encoded in the brain. Somehow it can be gone out of mind and then years later when the situation is appropriate, that information comes back to mind and it can help guide behavior. Now it's not just in place, though I think a cognitive map is a great analogy. It's something that includes both internal and external computations. And I don't just mean what we discussed before, these kinds of um, attractor states that are dynamic and driven by network action. I think it's absolutely crucial. But rather the internal signals, the internal milieu, things like motivation, uh, um, goals, rules, expectancies, all of these I think are part of the cognitive map, maybe serve as dimensions of the cognitive map, because they're ethologically relevant and needed to solve goal-directed actions. Um, the brain is an inference engine and the hippocampus is right at the heart of it, or the brain of it. So I'm going to go through a few experiments and then tell you some new information about how I think these non-spatial sorts of information become enfolded within the hippocampal map um, through particular circuits. So we have external sources of information like external stimuli. I don't know, is place or time external or internal? So I put these on the diagonal, I don't know. But I know that things inside, like how and why you do something, are going to be important for memory retrieval. You retrieve what you do because you have a goal. And so what I'm going to do is describe a few experiments that show non-spatial memory retrieval um, that require the hippocampus. And then I'll talk a little bit about medial prefrontal cortical uh, contributions to remembering which spatial trajectory you want to take because that rule is the one that's going to get you food. OK. And the bottom line is what we see, and this is not published except in abstract, is that the medial prefrontal cortex during learning Pattern separates hippocampal representations before the choice points in a maze, so that the so that the um, prospect of coding that have been, that's been described many times is actually better separated. And what that does is it reduces proactive interference, so the next time the animal has to learn something new, they learn it faster. Okay, so now let me go through the, the thing. All right, so this uh, this experiment was done by Janina Fabintinu, who was in the room, and it was just a question asking about how do place fields contribute to recent memory. And it was, it was really informed by Howard Eichenbaum and, and Lauren Frank. But what, what um, Janina did was design an experiment where rats put on the little blue platform to, in between trials, then put on the start arm, either the north or the south, and let uh, he was allowed to choose either the west or east arm to find food. And on each trial, the star arm was pseudo-randomly selected. And after the animal got 8 of 10 correct, OK, 9 out of 10 correct, then um, the animal had to learn to go to the other start arm. And this, these serial reversals occurred several times. And this behavior, the ability to do this successfully required the hippocampus completely. Not unexpected. The animal has to remember what and where and when. The goal is here now, but not later. And of course, when, when Janina recorded CA1 neurons in this task, you see these beautiful place fields. This is about 12 neurons recorded. You see it nicely maps the plus maze. And uh, as Lauren and Howard and other people described, if you look at how the firing varies with the particular memories, the signal is not tied to space. Uh, it is also tied to something else that I originally called temporal context, but I think you have to think about it more broadly. So what you see here. Uh, on the left is on, yeah, on I yes, on the left <laughs> is the overhead of the mu, the maze with just color blobs showing where cells fired, each cell with a different color. On the right, you see a discriminated unit with action potential shown in red. Um, on the right-hand panel, you see the uh, journeys that started in the north or started in the south on the bottom heading to the west. And what you can see is the, those little red dots only happen when the animal came from the north, not when he came from the south. So the cell wasn't simply coding place. It was coding the history of the episode that is uh, on the way to a goal. And we saw both, as been reported, both retrospective, as I just described, and prospective coding, which is especially interesting because those are the signals that could actually help guide a memory discrimination. That is, if you have a hippocampal representation that's different when uh, between goals, then that could actually help you uh, let memory actually help uh, guide the response. Now, what I want to do now, and I think this movie will work, but you know, I'm, uh, is, is, is show you uh, some really new unpublished data that 
I think establishes what the question really is. So what you're gonna see is this rat, and he's gonna go through a cartoon version of the plus maze uh, to get food. And what you can see in the physical room is there's two star arms in the north and the south, and two goal arms in the east and the west. And what we're gonna do is display hippocampal activity in the way that several people, including David Reddish, did using Bayesian decoding to tell from the population where the hippocampus thinks the rat is. So here's the, there's a white, little white circle showing where the camera says the rat is. There's two representations, one the little uh, green diamond that shows the best prediction of where 30 hippocampal neurons think the animal is, and then the probability function of where the animal might be in the rainbow colors. So when the animal starts in the task, you can see a couple of things. First, I'm gonna stop that and do it again. First, when he's at the start, what you can see is the animal's predicting not only which goal he's going to go to, but where he is, the origin. And as, <laughs> and, and as the animal goes through the task, you can see that. You can see this forward-looking projection that Bruce McNaughton described, that, that the, the, hip, the representation is pushing forward in the animal, and still the goal in the, and the start of this episode are encoded. Then, <laughs> don't pay any attention to that guy behind the curtain. Then, as the trial continues, oh, okay, there was a section where the other start arm started flickering on. And then as, then as okay, now, as he, approached, as he approached the choice point, both goals were represented. So anyway, the point is that this is a very cute movie, and you can see that the hippocampus doesn't simply encode where, where the animal is, microphone, um, but the entire structure, the start and the end of the task. So this is the kind of information that you would like to have. It includes space and time and goal. And if you could read it, you might be able to use it to uh, guide your perspective. Now, the thing I want to point out, and I'll just let those movies go, is that these are the same cells, the same 30 or 40 cells that are decoded in four different journeys in overlapping places. And the population knows not only where the animal is and where he's going, but what the other options are too. And, and this temporal extended code is what I really want to understand. First, what is this other than a, a cute math trick? And, and how does it happen? So the first um, new piece of information is this was a spatial task. Is the, are these differential representations of different spatial goals restricted to spatial goals? Or are they more general? And this is another experiment that Janina Fabinsonu did. She had animals do exactly the same behavior. One was guided by a spatial goal. One was guided by a little cue card. So, and then the animal just had to learn by trial and error whether it was a spatial trial, I mean a spatial block or a, a cue block, and then Gina recorded the same ensembles in both tasks. And what the point of this slide is, if you look at the activity along the rows, what you can see is that the, this is, oh, and this is only on the start arm. This is only activity that is matched for behavior as the animal is approaching a choice point. You can see, you can see the animal that you can see this population of cells, the same kind of thing you've seen before in 3D. Um, the, on the way to the northeast and the way to the north, and, and the way to the, sorry, on the way to the northeast going toward a queue is different than going to the northeast on the way uh, to a place and on, on identical behavioral journeys, the same in the other arm. And so what you actually get is a fourfold code, not only where you are and where you're going, but why. And um, Jim had something in here too, and uh, I love this. Whatever the basis of this mismatch aspect, he was talking about um, these uh, cells that, that, that responded when things weren't there. It seems to invoke, involve why the animal's behaving the way he's behaving. So let's look, talk about motivation. Pam Kennedy did this experiment, I'm ripping through it. The bottom line is the rat's put on a maze, and he's hungry or thirsty on different days. He starts a trial, and he knows he finds food in the yellow box. The yellow box moves on the next trial. He goes back to the yellow box to find food, uh, and so on until he gets a certain number correct. Then the next day he's thirsty. Instead of going to the places that were rewarded, he goes to the box that moves from trial to trial, and so on. And, and the only point I want to make from this, it, you know, you have identical behaviors in that start arm, and you have different representations on the way to the same places, depending on why you're going there. Are you going there to get food, or are you going there to get water? This is something that Richard Hirsch proposed a long time ago, um, and he proposed that the hippocampus was an, a contextual retrieval machine, and in this non-spatial case, it seems to be true. 
I'll skip it. All right, so now in two minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll see how many slides I can show you. So now what I want to know is, how do, you, how, do you, how do you retrieve these memories? Another way to put it is, how does, what signals come into the hippocampus so these prospective codes are selected and are active to guide behavior? And this experiment is done by Kevin Geis. He recorded uh, simultaneously in the medial prefrontal cortex and C dorsal CA1. And the same task I just described, this is a slide for Yuri. Um, showing on the top a bunch of slow waves, and I'm just going to say really quickly, when animals are walking through the start arm, the um, medial prefrontal cortex and CA1 are coherent and theta. And the cells are firing in a particular sequential order where in this case, as the animal is retrieving information, the medial prefrontal cortex activity precedes the CA1 activity. Um, what he did, what Kevin did, um, as he tracked the learning of the animal and then made a pseudo population code combining all the ensembles and all the trials, divided all of the learning curves into equivalent parts, you know, one of these normalization <coughs> tricks you've heard about, and then asked, what does this massive population code? It's too many dimensions to, to describe any way but compressing. And so what he did was he made these um, uh, multi dimensional scaling plots to reduce this high dimensional space to two. So what you see now is in the uh, red triangle, uh, sorry, in the green triangle surrounded by red is the first trial, and the green triangle surrounded by green is the last trial of these um, learning to go to one goal. So this is going to the east. Notice that in this multidimensional space, the population's in one spot. Now, at the first trial after the contingency changes, now you have to go west, you see the entire CO1 population drifts towards a different representation. It then goes back to the top of the slide, which is representing the state space location for goal one, and then finally on the last reversal, it switches back to the state that's representing um, goal two. And we see the same thing in uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, so we could ask, what's the direction of information flow? Is it the case that the hippocampus is informing the medial prefrontal cortex about the environment, or in the start arm, is it the case that the medial prefrontal cortex is helping the hippocampus separate places by rules, by the, the particular goal of the task? And the answer is the latter. Um, single ensembles were incredibly accurate at predicting what the animal would do one trial at a time in both PFC and CA1. Um, when, you, when you look at the population with ensembles using Granger causality analysis, what you can see is that early in learning, the medial prefrontal cortex has a strong influence on the succession of activity states in CA1 and not the other way. I'm blessing through this. I'll, I'm, and what seems to occur then is that the medial prefrontal cortex, in other words, in this analysis, you can see that the change in the medial prefrontal cortex predicts the amount of change in CA1, and it's not the other way. Does it matter? Yes. If you then categorize post hoc how quickly animals learn the next reversal, that is from going from east to going to west, what you can see is that the extent, the magnitude, of the influence of the medial prefrontal cortex on CA1 predicts how quickly the next discrimination is learned. So this is showing that in, the, in this, in this right-hand graph, the, in early learning, there's a massive increase in the information provided by the medial prefrontal cortex to account for the variance in the population state in CA1. And um, so the, uh, what, what I wanted to emphasize, and I forgot, this is, uh, what I, want, what I wanted to emphasize is that this task requires the medial prefrontal cortex only when you have to track changing goals. If you do the same inactivation of the medial prefrontal cortex, when the animal's learning one spatial discrimination, they're perfectly good. The next one, they're terrible. And the reason, and, and it, the, what, so what the medial prefrontal cortex is providing is this separation of hippocampal codes that are identical in space and behavior, but different in goal um, or you could call it a rule. So the idea I've tried to say is that episodes combine, boy, 20 minutes is really short, um, that the hippocampal representation in CA1 does provide a cognitive map, but as was suggested by several people before, it has more than just a two-dimensional Euclidean representation, includes internal and external states. And the, 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 these internal signals are combined through pathways that we can understand, and the one we've studied so far is how the medial prefrontal cortex alters CA1 coding as animals learn, and it predicts memory. So how do you retrieve the right memory? <laughs> you want something, and that your goal tells you, even though here you are, 
what you want is not to keep standing here, but actually to sit down. Thank you very much.